Start recording. So welcome everyone. This is the overview for today in case you missed it. Um, um, so history, DNA versus RNA. <laughs> Classic. Okay, yeah, thanks Commando. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm not, a, I'm not a professional streamer. I just do this as a side job. Like, it's not my main job. I'm a scientist, not a, not a streamer. Um, so history, DNA versus RNA, um, all of the different types of RNA, um, microarray expression, um, and if, then free microarray and RNA sequencing data. Where can you get it and how do you download it? Um, and one of the nice things is, is that like you don't have to ask for like a 300,000 euro grant um, to kind of do your research, um, especially if you're interested in like gene expression and gene regulation, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of stuff that you can get for free. Um, and then we will start with the more bioinformatics part, and then we will go and do a little bit of structure prediction on RNA, which I think is interesting. Uh, I like to do structure predictions a lot. Um, I don't get to do it a lot in my normal work, um, but every time that I can do it, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to do. So, um, yeah, first off, of course, um, we will do the assignments from last week. Um, I hope everyone was able to do the assignment. Just throw in chat if you were able to do it. Um, I think that um, the assignments are a little bit difficult, right? Like this was the first assignment where there was a little bit of R programming in there and it's not an R programming course. Um, so, um, I, I hope that people were able to do it. So if you were not able to do it, I'm not mad and I don't really... Um, I could not get R to work. All right. Um, that's diffic difficult. What kind of an operating system are you using then? Are you using Windows or Mac OS X or... All right. Nope. So another person... So do you want me to go through how to install R? We can, I can, I can show you how to do it. Um, Windows, okay, that's good. So Windows is actually the easiest one. Okay, so you used R with R Studio. Um, Commando says that it was doable, but you followed the R course, right, Commando? So that's, um, uh, yeah. Directory and file was the problem. Okay, yeah, because that's one of the harder parts in R. Since when you start R, uh, I got R Studio already, but couldn't do it. All right, um, good. So I can show you guys. Um, well, let me switch to Firefox then. Um, so if you wanna get R, um, I have to move the window a little bit. So if you wanna get R, you just say R download um, in Google and then you get here the, the first download. All right, Testosaurus says your PDF is really helpful. Oh, the big one that I, yeah. Yeah, I, I made it for incoming PhD students, so um, there's there's a lot of things in there. Um, there's a cheat sheet somewhere on my website as well, just a very small, like, two-page um, kind of what commands are there in R and how can you use them. Um, so if you just go here, you just say download R for Windows, um, and um, then you get, oh, you don't see the pop-up, but you get a pop-up, so you save the file. Um, and let me see if I can actually... Um, do that because I have R installed but I think I can just install it over it so I want to so first start the installer for you guys <coughs> it, yeah yeah the R studio thing is actually kind of something which goes on top of uh, um, of R um, and like I don't really like R Studio that much. Like the only real advantage of R Studio compared to standard R is that you can go back into the plots that you made previously. Um, let me see if I can actually capture the. Um, so I don't want to capture the whole display. I just want to capture a window, and the window that I want to capture is this one. So when you when you start the installer, um, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. Uh, and then it looks like this, right? So you say, I want to have it in English or in German, which is um, up to you guys. Oh, and then it doesn't capture the next one. <laughs> All right, um, so properties, which one? All right, and then you get like this, this standard installer um, for R, uh, which looks a little bit like this. And then you, hey, you have to read through the, uh, 
through the through the thing. Um, you should always do that. See if you're signing away all your rights to your firstborn children. Um, but in this case, it's quite okay. Um, you just tell it where you want to have it installed. Like I always install it on the C drive. Um, then, depending on which operating system you have, um, if you have a 32-bit Windows, which is still relatively old, hey Sandra. Welcome to the stream. So if you still have a 32-bit bit operating system, which is quite old, but it's then it doesn't allow you to install the 64-bit one. Um, but it's just next, and then, hey, if you want to specify any startup options, so we don't ever want to do that, it's just no. Um, create a folder. Well, don't do that. I don't like having R in the start menu. And then, hey, it will save the... Uh, and you can do a quick launch and stuff. And then you just press next and it will just start installing R. So it's just now copying the files over the files that I already had there. Which should all be fine. Like, I'm hoping that it uh, doesn't really screw up my R installation. Um, but, uh, hey, you can... You, this is kind of the... the in, in Windows it's relatively easy to install R. Um, so it's just like next, 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 finish. Um, and then it should work. Um, and um, if you want to have R Studio, then you can then download R Studio and put it on top of it, um, because that's the thing that you need, right? If you want to use the R Studio thing, then R Studio just uses the R program that you have installed. So if you have a version of R installed, which is like version 3.6, then you can still use R Studio, but R Studio is using the 3.6 R version in the in the past uh, that you installed. So. So when you then click finish, then um, there should be an R window at the bottom. Um, so if you go into your start menu, you will have two different R's installed. Because there will be the R 32-bit version and there will be the R 64-bit version. Um, so if you then start R, then you get a window which looks like this. And then I have to disable power. And this is just the standard R window that you get. Um, so the, the standard R window, um, I think when you start it up, it, it gives you some additional text. And here you can just start typing in stuff. So you can just say, well, what is 1 plus, plus 5? And then it will tell you that's 6. Um, and the nice thing about R is, is that you can do that with like lists as well. So you can have like a list. So I can say, give me a sequence from 1 to 100 going by 4. Right, so that's one, five, nine, and these things, right? So you just get a, a list of, of elements. Um, and then you can actually do like mathematics with that because you can just say, well, subtract six from, uh, from every, every element. Um, and then hey, it will just do that for the whole list. And that's, that's one of the advantages of R is that it's really good when you're working with like arrays or um, lists of numbers. Um, so um, let's clear the screen. Um, clear console. So that was like that's just the way that you install R. So Jan, um, Jan, you had problems getting R to work, right? So so did you get it to start up? Did you were you able to get a screen like this, or um, did you totally get stuck in the installer and it just says like it throws a whole bunch of like Windows errors in your face? All right, so you're able to get a screen like this. Okay, that that's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right, so then we can go through the assignment. So um, let me get my Word document. OK, so the first assignment was not using R directly. So the first assignment was going to the Ensemble database. Um, so let's go back to Firefox. Um, and let's close the R thing. So um, the idea was to go through the, uh, through the Ensemble database and then to compare the mitochondria, um, yeah, so the, the little pieces of DNA which are um, in the mitochondria, um, um, and, and you get inherited from your from your mother. Um, and then the question was to compare mouse, human, and zebrafish. Um, hey, observe that there's a huge overlap, but what are the differences? So to get to the mitochondria, the easiest, um, the way that I always do it is just go to the karyotype. Um, so the karyotype is kind of what you see when you put a, a genome underneath a, a microscope. Um, so if you go all the way in the back, then the, the mitochondria are here. Um, and hey, I just so when you go to the home page of Ensemble, right? So if you just go to the Ensemble main page, um, it looks like this, and you can just click on your favorite genome. So in this case, we, we click on the human genome, and I've already opened up the mouse and the uh, the Danio Ririo, so the, the zebra fish on the on the top. So um, so the idea was to to view the karyotype um, from 
for example, humans, there's different ways of going to the mitochondria, but you can just click on the mitochondria um, and then you just say, well, give me the, com uh, give me the summary um, because we want to compare them kind of globally, right? So I'm getting the summary of the, of the human uh, mitochondrial genome and then it takes a little while to have the image load in, um, but the, the summary is here on the bottom, right? So you can see that it's 16,500 base pairs long um, there's 13 genes on there, and there's 20, 24 non-coding genes. Um, so it's, it's, they're called small non-coding genes. And there's some short variants, which are generally microRNAs and, and transfer RNAs and stuff that you need. Um, and if we then look at the mitochondria in, in, in mouse, right? So we can go to the mouse, which I already opened. So again, we go to the karyotype. Um, and then we have to wait a little bit to... Ah, ensemble is really slow today. I can't really click on the mitochondria if it's not uh, <laughs> if it's not loading in. Um, da -da 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 -da. That's bad. So it's actually not. Lo let me let me re refresh the page. Actually, uh, is this the ad blocker? No, my ad blocker is disabled. So, all right. Um, so I can just copy the link on the top that I usually use for humans and then we can do the same thing for uh, for um, for mouse to get the overview and then Daniel Riero we do the same thing so go to view the karyotype oh, this one loads in really fast uh, you click on the mitochondria and just say give me the uh, give me the summary of the mitochondria right so now we have the summary so here also the summary picture loads in um, so you can see here the mitochondria um, you see the different genes that are encoded so these are protein coding genes meaning that they, they code for proteins um, then we have short non-coding genes um, and here you can see that those are more or less scattered all over while the non-coding or the protein coding genes are in a specific region so this this first region of the of the mitochondria it only contains like um, RNA so um, non-coding genes so genes which do not code for proteins but are still considered genes um, and then here you see the variation part um, so the variation part is how many known SNPs and indels and stuff are um, at a certain point so you can see that some points of the of the mitochondria don't don't have any um, which means that these regions when they get a mutation they are generally non-functional anymore but uh, the other parts of the mitochondria they, there, there can be small variations um, so did it load the other ones as well? Yeah, so this is the one for mouse and for humans it still didn't do that So let's see if we can reload it and get the picture. Well for humans the picture doesn't really want to load so um, But if we then look at the overview of the mitochondria and then we can see that um, for example in mouse and in humans We both have 13 genes. So this is the this is the human one. So humans have 13 genes on there um, Compared to mouse we see the same thing so mice also have 13 protein coding genes on the on the mitochondria. Um, if we then go to the uh, to the zebrafish, uh, we see that again 13 coding genes. And the length of the of the of the mitochondria didn't know that the info was in the karyotype. Yeah, you just have to click around a little bit, right? Um, you could have just searched for MT, um, then it gives you the mitochondria as well. Um, but I could have shown you that beforehand, but then like it's no fun like you have to go to the database and kind of get the information from there um, and then we discuss and then I'm showing you how I how I do that um, and so if we then look at the uh, at the number of non-coding genes um, then has zebrafish have 24 um, mice have 24 and human have 24 as well so there's no difference in the number of protein coding genes and the, the number of, of non-coding genes um, and the only major difference is um, is that there's a massive difference in the number of short variants. So the number of short variants is the amount of SNPs and, and indels that are um, located in the mitochondria. And for humans at 3,700, um, but for mice you can actually see that there's only very few short variants. Um, and the same thing holds for zebrafish. Zebrafish have even less. Um, and that, that has to do a little bit with um, kind of the amount of sequencing that has been done so but the conclusion is is that mitochondria are very much preserved so it doesn't really matter if you're looking at mitochondria from humans or from mice um, they have the same genes on there um, so it's it's one of the few chromosomes um, which is very much shared between almost all um, eukaryote life forms so all eukaryote life forms they have um, 
mitochondria and these mitochondria in general have 13 genes on there and they have 24 um, RNAs on there to make the mitochondria work. Um, so that was the first question. Just hit, click around a little bit in Ensemble and see if you can get the information out that you need. Um, hey, you can you can actually look at some some of these tabs here. So you can do like comparative genomics, like the Synteny. So you can click the Synteny tab, and then it it will show you. Uh, um, oh, um, hey, so you can actually compare the zebra, zebra fish directly with humans, um, but then you have to. I think you have to select the. Uh, use the links in the navigation box to move to the nearest one. Um, change chromosome. Yeah, I, I, I do want to do that, but I want to not do this little part of... Uh, I want to have the whole... Um, so I can jump to region and then... Alright, so here we're then looking at the region and then you see the different different genes and you see the different non-coding genes. So the genes themselves have names like MT and D1 um, and the non-coding genes have NC identifiers. Um, and then hey, there's a uh, it, there's the variants that are then listed on the on the bottom if you look uh, there. But hey, the idea was just for you guys to look at the database and struggle a little bit with with getting uh, getting the data out. All right, so let's move on to question number two. So the question is is what are the differences? Well, the differences are that there are a different number of of SNPs, um, so short variants um, in in the mitochondria, um, but that the mitochondria for the rest are more or less the same between mouse, human, and zebrafish. So three completely different species, but mitochondria, um, you could probably swap them in and out. So you could take a mitochondria of a zebrafish and put it in a human, and it will still work perfectly fine, um, and because they are they are very sim uh, similar. Um, all right, so then the question was, use the Ensemble database to download the FASTA sequence of the mouse gene, mitochondrial, NADH, dihydrogen. NADH dehydrogenase 1 um, and the official name of the genus MTNDA1 so it's the first gene on the genome um, so what we can do is we can go all the way back and we can say go to go to the mouse and then we can just type in the real name so it's MT minus um, ND1 um, and then hey, it will just say it's a human gene, a zebrafish gene and a mouse gene so in this case we want to have the mouse gene um, so we just click on it and then it directly brings us here to the MTND1 gene page. Um, so the question was is to use the export data function on the side. So if you go a little bit down, then here you have export data. So when you click export data, you get this overview here. And the question was um, uh, um, go for the text output. Um, so you can do the, the tab or uh, but comma separated values. But um, the text output in this case is just a FASTA sequence. Um, and Hey, um, do we want any three prime and five prime sequences? No, we just want to have the gene um, hey, because it allows you to get like a thousand base pairs in front or a thousand base pairs in the back um, and the maximum number of base pairs that you get can get in front of a gene or in the back of the gene is um, like one million. Um, so, And then hey, there's this option here to do it unmasked or masked and that means that if you ask for a mask sequence it will take the DNA sequence and it will look for areas of the sequence which are not unique so which are occurring at different positions in the genome. So when we will be talking about primer design this will be really important. Um, so if you are designing primers you'll want to always do this on a mask sequence and this is because uh, primers need to be unique um, so you want to kind of block out the parts of the sequence which are also found in the same animal in different parts of the genome. Um, we can then click next um, and then it will load the content and then it just hits so you can then select the output format which is the text output format and then it will just look somewhat like this. So it will just give you a single sequence which I didn't want actually because I wanted to have the... Uh, that's interesting. Ah, okay, so I have to here say select all because I, I, I want I want all of the sequences and not just the DNA sequence. I also want to have the coding sequence and the peptides and the introns and the exons. Um, so we do it again. We go to text output and then you see that it gives you different sequences. So first it gives you the first transcript of the gene um, and this is the cDNA. So it's the, it's the, 
the, the coding DNA, so the DNA which translates to the protein. Um, so you have here the first sequence, and then you have the same sequence again, which is for the gene. So this is for the transcript, then you see the gene sequence, and then here you get the protein coding part, um, which again is the exact same in case of this gene. Um, and then here you see the, uh, the sequence, which is the amino acid sequence, um, which is how the uh, how the protein is built, right? So amino acids can be coded with a single letter as well. Um, so M stands for methionine um, and so on. So, um, and then of course we have the, the same sequence again, which is the chromosomal sequence. So in the chromosome it's written down like this. So this is a gene which doesn't have any introns or exons. Um, and that is because it is a mitochondrial gene. Mitochondrial gene come from prokaryotes, right? It's a prokaryotic cell which has been absorbed into a eukaryotic cell. Um, so, and like we talked about gene structure, about the DNA structure last time, uh, where we showed that there's a massive difference between how bacteria code protein, or how code um, um, proteins and how um, eukaryotes code proteins. So eukaryotes generally have introns and exons, um, but prokaryotes do not. So, hey, of course, the mitochondria, since it is from prokaryotic origin, it codes proteins in the same way as a bacteria does, um, although it is part of the eukaryotic cell. All right, so then we, we just save this in a, in a, in a document. So um, there is a way that you can do that in Firefox. It's just file and then save as, and then you can save it as. All right, so then the next part is um, hey, after we have this file, um, hey, you save the file on your hard drive in a known location such as, and then hey, you can pick out that for yourself. So let me switch to the R window. So let's close the Firefox one. All right, so here we're in the R window, right? So once we have installed R and that all works, um, um, I ask you guys to create a new file called um, like your answers. So I will show you guys my answer file now. Um, I have here Notepad++. So I always use Notepad++. I think it's a nice editor, but you can use any editor that you want. Um, so here it's answer, so 3dna.txt. Um, so when I'm, when I'm doing these kinds of things, I always like to put in a little bit of a header um, so that I know what's the content of the file when I open it. Um, so this is where I saved the file. So I saved it in D, D drive project, lectures, bioinformatics and animal breedings, bioinformatics um, course 2016-2017, um, which was the first time that I did the course. Um, and then I put it in the assignments folder there. So it's a long path in, in my case, but you could have just put it on the C drive. Um, so then you just do set working directory. Yeah, so to move um, or to make R move from one directory to another, um, you use the set working directory. So normally when you, when you boot R standard, um, you can use the command get working directory to see where you are. Um, so in this case, I already set my working directory to this, to this folder, right? So if I do a set working directory um, to, for example, my D drive, um, I can do it like this. Um, and now when I say get working directory, then it says, well, you're on the, on the D drive. Um, and you can do like a dir command, I think, and then it lists all of the things which are on your D drive. So you can see that I have like a folder called bool s, which is not bullshit, but it's bool related stuff. Um, so cows. Um, and I have a couple of other things. And I, I used to have three hard drives, so a C drive, a D drive, and an E drive, but then I got a new computer which only had a D drive, so I, I made a folder called D drive and a folder called E drive, which holds the content of the old. But that's just the way that I organize my computer. Um, you, of course, organize your computer in your own way, um, so you could have put it anywhere. So if you only have a C drive, then you could have made like something like C um, bioinformatics slash lectures or assignments or something like that. All right, so let's go back to where we want to go. Um, so I just use the notepad and then I say, well, set my working directory to here because that is where I save the, uh, the empty nd1.fasta file. Um, so I just set it there. All right, question. Um, how do you read lines a .fasta file when it's a txt file? Um, well, you can you can use read lines on any file, even on an image file. It will just try to load lines and 
um, it is a text file, right? It's just having a different extension. It's just called .fasta. Um, in computers, um, computers don't care about the extension of a file. The extension of a file doesn't mean anything. It's just for us humans to kind of have a handle on what's in there. Um, Windows cares in a bit because yeah, if you call a file.exe, then when you click on it, Windows will try to execute it. Um, but you can save a text file as an executable file with like a .exe extension, and that won't change what is in the file. Um, so it's uh, and if you save the data as txt, you might have to add .txt. Yeah, but like I said, extensions are meaningless. Like if you're using a Linux system, then Linux doesn't care what extension you give it. You can even make files without an extension and that's perfectly fine. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Because, yeah, um, um, commando, that is because you are hiding the extensions in Windows. So Windows has an option, um, which is the hide known extensions. So then it will show you not the real file name. Um, that's something that you actually have to disable because that's making you very susceptible to clicking on viruses. Because I, if you download a file which is virus.txt.exe, then if you click on it, or if you look at the file in Windows, Windows will just show you virus.txt. Um, so, and then you think, oh, it's a TXT file, so it's fine to double click on it. But then when you double click on it, because the extension is hidden, um, it, it doesn't allow you to do that. I can show you where that is in Windows. Let me open up a thing, um, because I, I always think that that's one of these things that you should change. So let me add a window capture, new window capture. I want to capture this thing. So when you just have a standard like um, Windows, it doesn't really matter where you are, but you can go to view on the top here and it doesn't show you uh, yeah there so um, and then you have here file name extensions right show or hide the set of characters added to the end of the file that identifies so you always want to have this enabled so to show the file name extensions and then in options you have this change folder and search options which will open up a little additional window let me see if I can capture that window as well um, all right uh, so you then get something which looks like this right and then you can go to view and then here um, there's this um, uh, hide extensions for known file types and this should be off because then if you are downloading something called virus.txt.exe it will hide the .exe because it knows that .exe is a known file type um, so this one should always be off um, because then it's just hiding part of the file name and you want to see it all right, so that's good, right? So it's just a tip. Like, you can hide it, right? But, like, then you don't know exactly what the file name is. Um, so, hey, if you, would, if you would do that, and then you would look at your file again, then it would actually see, or it would actually say that the file is called mtnd1.fasta.txt. Um, yeah, so it's, it's just you always. And then actually this... this um, um, hide. Uh, there's there's another one. Don't show hidden files and folders or drives. Uh, you do want to show hidden folders and files and drives. At least I want to. Um, okay, I totally get the point. Yeah, yeah. So so to show hidden drives and files and stuff is also useful because if you have a virus, then viruses usually live in hidden files. Um, so that that's. But this is just some general Windows stuff. Like on, on Linux, you know, I never have to worry about this because like extensions don't mean a thing. So um, it's it's all fine. All right, let's close these ones up then. And then um, let's go back to R. So in R, I want to um, set my working directory and then load in the file. So I'm going to go to hide the notepad. And then we're going back to R. So when we're going back to R, and here you can also see some of these hidden files, right? Like the system, the recycler folder is something that Windows standard hide. This is your like trash bin, um, and then you have this dollar recycle bin, which is another recycle bin, um, and then you have your system volume information, which actually is you shouldn't throw this file away, but you can see it and you can see what's in there. So once we've loaded it right, then um, because we, we read in all of the lines in this file and then put it in this variable, so we can then just type empty ND1 um, and that will show us all of the stuff which is in the file. 
So this is just what I just showed you on the on the Firefox window. It's just the same thing. Um, and hey, it has these little dollars here because it actually continues and it, it cannot fit everything on the same line. So if you do it like this, right, then it will show you dollars and say, well, I cut off some of the lines because they were too long. All right, so this is then the file that we've loaded in. So, and then we can start doing stuff with this file, right? So the first question that there was is, um, um, uh, load in the file how many FASTA sequences are in the file so each sequence starts with um, this this like um, greater than symbol or smaller than depending on how you how you read it so hey you just go through and you say well this is one so this is one sequence um, this is a second sequence um, this is three um, this is four and this is five so in total, I have five sequences in my file. So the answer to this question, um, like I've written down in my more or less cheat sheety thing, is there are five sequences. So that I wrote it down. I like writing down stuff so to make it explicit. All right, and then I, uh, the next step is to use the table function um, because the table function is really, really useful in R. It, it tables stuff, so it just looks at stuff which is similar and then just counts the number of occurrences of things. Um, so um, we want to table the variable um, just to see first what happens. So let me disable the window captures and then go back to R. So we want to table the uh, MT. And the nice thing about R is, is that when you're coding, right, and you, you type MT, right, and now I I already forgot because I don't have the other window open anymore. So in R, you can press the tab key, and it will show you what it, what you can what you can use, right? So um, these show this shows all of the variables and functions starting with MT. So there's a variable called MT cars, which is default in in, in R loaded. Um, you have M text, which is a function to put text on a on a on a on a figure, um, and you have MT ND one. So I just do MTND1 and I just type the N and then press top and then it auto completes the thing. So when I do this, it shows me that, well, for example, this sequence here is in this file four times. Um, this sequence here is in this file also four times. Um, and we see that some of the sequences here, like this one, is only in this file one time. Um, but it gives you a kind of an overview. And you can see here that the, the five different names that we have now all of a sudden pop up at the beginning. Um, and had this one is um, in there three times. I think it's three times, one time. I don't know why the three is above the thing. Uh, it's probably because it's too long. But uh, let me see. No, so this thing is in there one time. But it just gives you a table. So it gives you an overview of, of how much a certain thing is in there. And of course, this is not really useful doing it on the whole file. Um, so hey, what you can do is, for example, say, well, I take the second line from this variable, um, which is just the, the letter code, right? And then I can say, well, I, I can string split this. Um, so I can, and I can split it um, on every non-character so this means just split after every character so when I do this then it then it separates the different characters from each other um, and then it puts this in a list because I, I can do this not just for a single line but I could do this for two lines as well right so I can say do this for line two um, two line three um, so now it will split line number two and it will split line number three. And since it needs to keep these things separate, it puts them in a list. So this is a list identifier, so the double brackets. And um, this is a, but hey, in this case, in the assignment, we just wanted to use line number two. Um, and then we want to unlist this to get the, uh, the, the, the thing without having it being in a list. So in R, this means that this is the first list element. Um, and then this is a, this is a vector and this vector starts at 1, then this is number 20, 28, and this is number 55 in the vector, um, and then the vector is like 59 or 60, 60 long. So if we unlist it, um, we get rid of this double, double quote thing 1, um, and that is just because we could have done this on multiple lines, but we're doing it only on a single line, so we, we want to unlist it to get rid of the fact that it's a, an, an, a vector stored in a list. All right, and then we can use the table function again on top of that. So we then say, well, table unlist this thing, um, and then it counts the number of base pairs for us. 
which is really handy. So this first line of the of the file it contains 13 A's, 20 C's, 9 G's, and 22 T's. And so you can you can see the it it makes some some sense to do this um, because otherwise we would have counted them by hand. Um, but as a bioinformatician, you don't really want to count things by hand. You want to use something like R or Python or a different language to do the counting for you. Um, and of course, we could have done this um, as well for the, the first like five lines. So we say line two until line six. Um, and then here we just say string split them, unlist them, and then table them. And then we can see that there are well, 98 A's. 82 C's. Yeah, so this this allows us to count through like big sequences and and get a very very quickly get an overview of how many A, C, T's and G's are in there. All right. So the question was um, using the square brackets we can look into the object and um, the question is um, how many A's are in the first line of the sequence? So there are 13 A's. Um, so here. 13 A's. So when we take the first line, which is actually in the second line, because the first line of the file is the name of the sequence, and then the second line of the file is the first line of the sequence. So 13 A's. Um, so you could have counted them by hand, um, but um, you, you don't have to. All right, and then the next thing is to start using a little bit of programming and a little bit of logic. Uh, let me get my notepad window back. Um, so had the, 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 the code was more or less given, right? So um, I just had this is just the exact same code as what was in the assignment. Um, so hey, let's just let's just see what it does. Um, so um, we can just copy paste it in and hey, what it does, it, it string splits the line. Um, that we're currently looking at. So you go through all of the lines of MTND1, so of the variable, um, and then head every time that you go through this loop, what we do is we then take the line, we split it by the individual characters, take the first character and put that as first letter or first character. Um, and then we cut, so cut is the way that you can print to the R window. Um, so we say cut the first letter and then add an enter behind it. Um, so when we run this in R, um, it looks something like uh, this. Uh, um, and it will just go through the whole file and just show us the first. Yeah, so when we look at the first line, of course, it starts with a greater than symbol because this is the and the name of this thing comes after. And then the next one is a G, an A, a G. Yeah, so these are the first letters of the second line, first letter of the third line. Yeah, so if you get a plus in the command line testosaurus, um, a plus means that the command that you're typing is not yet finished. Um, so hey, if you if you see here this little plus, it means that here I opened up a bracket, but I haven't closed it yet. So I can just continue on typing until I close the bracket. So in your case, if you if you count, you see you have table opening bracket opening a round bracket once, then opening a second round bracket after unlist, then you do spring split, which is the third bracket, but then in the end of your command you only have two of them closed because you have you have two closing brackets. So you, you, you have to add an additional third closing bracket because of course it needs to be balanced. If you have three opening brackets you need three closing brackets as well. So it's like it's fiddly, right? You have to um, if you're programming, it's like it has to be exactly correct. It's like doing something in the lab, right? Forgetting a single chemical um, will make your thing not work. <laughs> so that the same thing holds for programming, like forgetting a single closing character. Um, so if you see the plus in front of it, it means that the command has not finished yet. Um, so that means that you're either for forgetting a closing bracket or you're for forgetting like a double air quote somewhere. Um, and then here you can type on and on and on. Um, if that happens, you can actually just press the stop, bu stop button here. The stop button will, will um, stop the input. So if I would do something like uh, give myself a variable, um, which I would store a string in, um, right, like this, and I forgot to close it, right, then I can just continue on typing, on typing, on typing. And if this happens, right, and I want to calculate like 8 plus 9, um, and I don't get an output, then I know, oh, I'm I'm still I'm still inside of a command. So then I can just press the stop button, and it will just end the command for me, because I might have not known what what is the thing that I'm forgetting. 
All right, but the first letter part that we that we did is just it's just a little bit of coding. Um, so you go through all of the lines in the variable, and then you use the string split with the unlist to get the first element, so the first letter of the line, and then you can do that. All right. So then in the in the next question, the uh, um, there was a little bit of you having to think about it um, and then had the same structure hold so it's for the line in the empty and the a get the first letter and then had the, the question was can you decide if something is um, empty right because there are some empty lines in the file um, if the first letter is um, a greater than symbol then of course this is an identifier or a, or a sequence name and else, right, if it's not a greater than symbol or if it's not empty, then it's actually a DNA sequence. Um, so had the, the, um, had the, the idea was that you, had that you can use programming logic to decide what is in every line of the file. Um, so, and here I use the else if structure, so to say if, if it is not, if it is NA, the first letter, then it's empty else if when the first letter is 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 equal to the greater than symbol then it is an identifier and else this line contains a dna sequence so it's just a way of of saying what what every line does so i can copy paste this into r just to show you guys what happens um, and that was more or less it um, for the assignments um, so had the idea is to just go through each of the files and then you see that it now kind of identifies so it says well the first line contains an identifier um, and then there's a bunch of lines which have DNA sequence um, and then there's another identifier then you get a bunch of a DNA sequence again um, and you see here that at some point in the file there's like an empty line so there's a line which has no no characters on there um, and at the end of the file there's two additional empty lines as well so and the R is just for you guys to, to practice. I will never ever ask anything about R on the on on the exam um, because it's not an R course. It's a bioinformatics course. But be aware that like I, a lot of the assignments will contain some R um, because I do think that like you need to be faced with the fact that without being able to program, bioinformatics is not going to work that well. Um, so hey, you can only really do bioinformatics if you're able to program, um, and hey, with the um, with the short tutorial PDF that I showed you last week, um, and then more or less the the coding examples that are in the uh, assignments, um, you should be able to pick up some basics of R um, to be able to do some of the coding. So. And that's also one of the reasons why I don't force people to do the homework because like the homework is just for you guys to be um, to kind of learn how to do things. All right. So are there any other questions? Remarks? Frustrations that you want to share with me and the other people who are here? No. I have to wait a little bit. I think there's a little bit of a delay in uh, in Twitch. So, but just let me know. So um, it's up to you guys if you want to do more R. If you want to have like a single lecture in which I kind of explain the basics of R, then we can do something like that. Um, if you say I don't want to do any R, I just want to look at the database and have a much more uh, going by hand. Um, Florian Eberswalde, it's dark and cold. How do you mean it's dark and cold? It's not that dark yet. It, it can be a lot darker outside, so. Yes, please. What, what's the yes, please? The yes, please is no more R or um, more R <laughs> or have a lecture about R. Okay, it would be nice to have a lecture on R. Okay, then. Um, we, we will do a, a, a small lecture about R, about the very basics of R. Um, and um, yeah, we can do that in the regular time. So we, we, we will put that for next week. I, I won't do that this week because this week we have to do the RNA stuff. And I really want to get rid of that. Like I told you, I, I don't really like the RNA lecture. I don't like talking about 60 different forms of RNA, but uh, all right. 
Why is Florian actually not a VIP guy? Could Anna, is it possible that you give him VIP status or do I have to do that? I, I think you you should be able to, you're a moderator, so you, you could give Florian a VIP like little diamond in front of his name. Although now he really stands out because everyone talking is actually VIP and Florian is not, so <laughs> All right, so that was it for the uh, for the assignment. So let's close the R window and then go back to the PowerPoint, which is over here. Too bad. <laughs> exactly. If everyone is VIP, no one is VIP. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We can revoke your VIP status as well, Commando, if you want. That. Uh... <laughs> All right, so I've been recording for 45 minutes, so we can do a couple of slides before we uh, before we take a little break. So, all right, so um, word in advance, I already told you a couple of times, there will be a lot of theory. There will be a lot of going through. This is snow RNA, SN RNA, my RNA, mRNA, pre mRNA, and these kinds of things. So just bear with me because we will have some more fun bioinformatics at the end of the lecture. So how where can you? Uh, oh, you can't promote people to VIP. Oh, that's good. That's good. Then Florian's just not not a VIP, so that's okay. You could give him a timeout, though. Yeah, well, the the remark was not really related to the lecture, so you can give him like a thirty second timeout. Or he's not talking that much anyway. So um, anyway, so um, had the the nice bioinformatics stuff will be at the end of the lecture, just so that everyone stays until the end. So. Things like where to download uh, DNA and RNA data or free microarray data. Um, and um, there will be a couple of slides and perhaps even a live demo on RNA structure prediction. And somewhere in between the lecture, I'm also going to show you my 3D engine. So I wrote a 3D engine in the D programming language. Um, and since we're talking about like 2D and 3D structure of proteins and RNA, well, mostly RNA this today, proteins will be next week. Um, I wrote a visualizer which allows you to visualize protein, 3D protein structures, so crystal structures, um, and allows you to fly through it and, and click on stuff, or not really click on it, but you can go through it. Um, and I wanted to show you guys that as well, since I've been working on it for five years or something. And it's, it, it does more than just doing the 3D structures of proteins, but I think that's one of the things that looks pretty. All right, so a lot of theory, bioinformatics at the end. All right, so a question to you guys. Um, what is the central dogma of molecular biology? Um, since we're talking about like hand, like the way that I structured the lecture should give you a little bit of a hint uh, what the central dogma of molecular biology is. Um, but I, I think that like it's good that people know this and it will definitely be a question on the on the exam so you can give an answer now and see if that is the answer that I would give or the answer that would get you the points on the exam so in chat um, just throw like what do you think is the central dogma of, of molecular biology and no googling well you could but It is the coolest of all biologies. <laughs> I agree, I agree. I have a master in molecular biology, so I would definitely agree that molecular biology is way, way better than like behavioral biology or these kinds of things. But uh... All right, John Hager says DNA to mRNA as to uh, proteins. Yes, yes, yes. The best biology. No, it's not the bigliest biology, but... Uh... Molecular biology is, is like, it's, it's interesting. And, um, but the central dogma that we have in molecular biology, so when you get taught molecular biology or do a master, um, then this is always what they teach you, right? The central dogma is that you have DNA, which is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into proteins. So that is the central dogma. So the central dogma is very basic in, in, so DNA is the carrier of genetic information. RNA is more or less the intermediate between the, um, keep your recording. Yeah, yeah, I just said to you guys, I have, I'm recording for like 50 minutes. So we can do a couple of slides and then we will have a break. Um, I actually have new GIFs 
during the break. So we can actually vote on which GIFs you want to see. But then back to the central dogma, DNA, translation, RNA, tra uh, DNA, transcription, RNA, translation, protein. So if we get the question in the exam, um, then hey, the central dogma in molecular biology is that DNA is the carrier of genetic information, RNA is the intermediate, so coupling the DNA world to the protein world, and proteins are more or less the effector molecules, the molecules that do stuff. So they, they make a cell work. Um, and during the lecture we will actually see that this dogma is not entirely correct um, because RNA also does stuff itself. So it's not just the proteins that do stuff, um, RNA can do stuff as well. Um, and of course we will talk a little bit about the RNA uh, world hypothesis. Alright, so I think we can go to like two slides of history. Um, and I only have two slides of history and then we will take a break. So we already saw Friedrich Mischner. So Friedrich Mischner is kind of the godfather of, of DNA and RNA because he's actually the guy that more or less discovered DNA, right? He came up with his nuclein, uh, so the, the, the weird, uh, weird protein uh, that he found um, inside the cell nucleus, which was not able to be cut by uh, proteolytic enzymes, um, which he then called nuclein. Um, and he actually figured out that when he when he did his experiments that there are two different types of nuclein. So hey, there's two different types, so, so DNA and RNA, hey, the names were not coined yet um, in, in 1868, um, but he discovered that when you look into a nucleus of a cell, uh, there are two different substances in there. That's how he described it. Two different nucleins, um, one which we now know is DNA and another one which is which we now know is RNA. And they have different chemical properties. So he already had, because he was a chemist, he looked at the chemical properties of the different molecules and he said, well, this is these are two separate and, and unique molecules. Um, so and then in 1959, we have uh, Severo Ocha, uh, and Severo Ocha is actually the guy that, in, that, well, not invented, but that discovered that there's something called mRNA. So, hey, he discovered that mRNA is, 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 the, is, the, is the, the thing um, which informs or directs protein synthesis. Um, and hey, that's a, the, he has a really good paper on, on how this happens. Um, and hey, in 1960s, so more or less at, at the exact same time, a lot of people were working on, okay, so we now know that we have this DNA stuff, um, which carries genetic information, and how does that, this now kind of tie in? Um, and hence, so this is kind of in the discovery of the dogma. So had, when, when people were looking into the nucleus and into the cytosol of cells, they found that, well, there's, there's like nuclein and DNA is more present in the nucleus. And then inside the cytosol, we have normally proteins, um, but we also find a large amount of this messenger RNA there. And then using different experiments, they, they found out that, that had, that RNA or messenger RNA carries the genetic information from the nucleus to the cytosol to make proteins. Um, in the 1960s they figured out that ribosomes are the things that make proteins um, and then in 1965 um, Holly, uh, Robert W. Holly, uh, figured out that there is this physical link so that there's something called tRNAs, so transfer RNAs, um, that actually couple the uh, messenger RNA with the protein. So we will talk extensively about tRNAs. Um, but um, before that, of course, in 1957, um, RNA polymerase was purified, and so that allowed molecular biologists to start using RNA polymerase um, to, to make RNA from DNA. So hey, if you would have DNA and then you add RNA polymerase, then that DNA is being transcribed into RNA. And then um, in 1983, the year that I was born, we have also one of my heroes in molecular biology, Kerry Mullis, um, who invented polymerase chain reaction. So PCR is kind of the fundamental method used in molecular biology to study DNA um, and or RNA. Um, and Kerry Mullis is a very, very interesting figure and like I could fill a whole lecture just about him. Like he got a Nobel Prize for his invention of, of PCR, um, and it's just a very interesting story, but it's a story for a later time, um, because otherwise I'm talking for another hour here and we don't 
don't go through the whole lecture. But during the uh, during the primer design slash PCR lecture, which will come up, um, I will talk extensively about him and about his life and about his theories and um, I will probably also make you read his paper on time travel because it's just one of the best papers on time travel I ever read. Um, and then um, in 1989 um, there was this another big discovery yeah he's denying HIV and AIDS and he's a strange guy yeah but he's an interesting guy like um, I love Nobel Prize winners like I always say like if you if intelligence is is on a scale it's more like a speedometer right so zero is at the top and then you have like your maximum speed on the other side and and people who win Nobel Prizes generally are flipping between the two so they're either in like a genius mode or they're in complete idiot mode um, and and Kerry Mullis is one of these good examples for that but um, all right, the next big step in polymerase chain reaction, right, the fundamental methodology in molecular biology um, is that from this thermophilic bacterium, Thermos aquaticus, um, a polymerase, so a DNA polymerase was extracted and this DNA polymerase is stable up to very high temperatures, which it has to be in this bacteria, of course, because it lives near these hot springs um, in the in the ocean. Um, so hey, it, it it allows us to do PCR in a in a much faster way than before. Before we used like polymerases, which were not that temperature sensitive, uh, which would function at much lower temperatures, which makes PCR much harder to do but with this invention of this polymerase which can actually work at like 70 degrees Celsius um, doing PCR became a lot easier and it became kind of a, a, a common technique which is done in every molecular biology lab around the world. Um, so in 1978 there was the discovery that genes are commonly interrupted by introns that must be removed by RNA splicing. Um, so hey, here when we're talking about like the, the dogma hey, where you have DNA RNA then this falls into the RNA level where people figured out that when you have a long RNA molecule hey, that this RNA molecule has something which is called exons which are coding for protein and they have introns and these introns they have like a regulatory function um, but they they do not code for protein so they have to be removed and the process for this removal uh, was invented or was discovered by Walter Gilbert um, and this is um, that the introns have to be removed and that this is called RNA splicing. Um, another nice um, discovery in the RNA world was done in, uh, in 1973 um, and Later again, it was predicted in 1973 to be there, and then it was like confirmed in 1984. Um, and that there, it, that is that there is something called telomerase, um, um, and telomerase is an RNA template, or it, telomerase is a protein which uses a built-in RNA template. So it's a it's a protein with a little piece of RNA inside of the protein, um, and that is that is maintaining the chromosome ends because every time that a chromosome divides um, the polymerase will copy the DNA right but polymerases have to start somewhere so they can't copy the whole DNA they can only copy like the the middle part of it and they have to have at the end they can't exactly copy up until the end they fall off so every time that a chromosome divides it loses somewhere around 100 to 150 base pairs um, so that means that the chromosomes become shorter and shorter and shorter and um, inside a cell there is this telomerase protein which uses RNA inside of it to kind of um, stabilize the end of the chromosome so to make these chromosome ends longer again so um, we already talked about um, um, Barbara McClintock's is DNA element, so the, the jumping genes, the transposons. Um, has, so the transposons were discovered in 1948, um, but somewhere around 1970 people realized that many of these transposons actually use an RNA intermediate um, to jump around. So again, RNA, very important when we talk about transposons. Um, and one of the m newer discoveries in the 1990s is that small RNA molecules regulate gene expression by post-transcriptional gene silencing. 
Um, so this is also where short interfering RNA technologies are based on. So the fact that you can use um, small pieces of RNA to bind to mRNA to kind of have this mRNA degraded and to kind of not have mRNA produce proteins. And this is a common way of the cell to regulate gene expression, um, but it's also a really common way nowadays to regulate gene expression if you want to kind of make a, a, a knockout of a gene. You don't have to kind of cut the gene out of the genome anymore. And no, you can use like a complementary piece of RNA, which you then bring into the cell using lipofectamine or other techniques. Um, and this little piece of DNA will bind to the messenger RNA and the messenger RNA will be uh, degraded. And then um, in uh, 2001, Eddie came up with uh, the... Um, with the theory that there is non-coding RNA um, which controls the epigenetic phenomena. So the epigenetic phenomena is the way that some DNA molecules or some base pairs are actually methylated or not methylated and there are other ways that that base pairs can be changed, chemically changed, um, and this chemically changing of base pairs was actually um, um, is actually uh, an epigenetic phenomena because it's something that is attached to the genome but not part of the genome um, and this is this is controlled by non-coding RNAs as well. All right so now we've done one hour of recording so I will stop the recording and then um,